Hello, everyone who's joining us so far. Uh, we're going to get started in about two or three minutes. In the meantime, uh, we're just going to let the slideshow run to welcome everyone in. Um, I'm sitting in downtown Vancouver right now. Uh, it's a gorgeous sunny day outside, so if you're also in Vancouver, thank you for spending this sunny afternoon with us. Um, and if you want to share where you're joining us from, that would be wonderful. I'd love to know where people are joining from. Um, one quick note about that, uh, make sure you change your chat settings so that it's the panelists and attendees so that we can all see where you're joining us uh, from. So if you feel like sharing where you're joining us from, that'd be wonderful. From Victoria, hello Lee, welcome. Thank you for joining. I'm also curious who here, and also Patterson from Victoria, great. I'm curious to hear uh, who of you uh, who are in this event right now, who, who has read the book already? So from Brampton, Ontario, Wendy, welcome. Sam from Toronto, welcome. Thank you for joining all the way from Toronto. Um, I know it's 10 p.m. over there, so uh, it's wonderful to hear that you stayed up to watch this event. We're going to get started in two minutes for those of you who just joined. We're just you know, waiting for some folks to, to slowly make their ways into the room. They'll be starting the book this weekend. Great. I highly recommend it. Wonderful. So um, for those of you who just joined, we are just sharing um, where everyone is, is sitting right now, where you're joining us from. And I was, I'm going to ask you a quick favor to Wendy and Sam, if you feel like it, uh, change the settings on your chat so that we can all read your messages. So there's a little button that says panelists right now. So if you want to click on that blue button, um, it should give you the option to switch it to panelists and attendees and that way everyone can read your messages and we'll all feel like we're in the same room together even if we're not. So Catherine from Kitsilano, thanks for joining us. Samuel from East Van, wonderful. Thanks everyone for joining from afar. One second, I'll be back. Great, so we're going to get started now. Um, my colleague Candy is in the background making sure that everything runs smoothly, so say hi to Candy in the chat. Um, we're going to take that slideshow off and I'm going to um, start the event. Ruth, Tron, great. So, hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Jorge Amigo and I'm the head of cultural programming for the Vancouver Public Library. I'm going to be your host today. My colleague Candy is also working on the event. Uh, they'll be in the background making sure that everything runs smoothly, so please say hi to them in the chat. Now, I want to thank Pulp Fiction Books for partnering with the library on this event. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, Pulp Fiction is an independent bookstore with three locations in Vancouver. They have an incredible selection of new and used books, as well as a really good graphic novel selection. And Personally, what I love the most about Pulp Fiction is that they can special order any book and they usually get them in for about 40% less than I would pay at a corporate bookstore. So uh, I myself read a lot of novels in Spanish and they've always been great at getting those for me. So we're going to share a link to Pulp Fiction in the chat. And the quick surprise that I want to share is that uh, they're offering an extra discount on the creep for the next two weeks. So if you're like me and you like to purchase your book so you can underline them and annotate all over them, um, go get a copy with Pulp Fiction and say hi to Chris when you're there if you visit the Main Street location. Now, before we move on with the event, I want to acknowledge that we are hosting this event from the traditional, ancestral, unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Tooth. And I want to encourage all of you to read and understand the history of this land and the people who have taken care of it for thousands of years and what it means for you to be here. Now, if you're joining us from another part of the country, as I saw in the chat, there's people from everywhere. Um, there's a great resource that we're going to share in the chat so you can learn about the land where you live. Now, apart from doing a land acknowledgement, I, I also want to take a moment to remind us of the moment that we're in. Um, last week, we learned that the remains of 215 children were found in a mass grave at the site of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, which operated until 1978. I want to remind the audience that more than 150 
thousand children were taken to residential schools, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has called this practice cultural genocide against indigenous peoples. People across the country are hurting from this terrible news, um, and we're seeing renewed calls for action from government and institutions. And I think it's also an opportunity for us, or for people like me who are settlers on this land, to think about what we can do to dismantle colonial systems and to learn more about the history that made these mass graves even possible. So since I work at a library, I'm gonna share three resources with you before we start the event. So the first one is a list of podcasts by indigenous creators that we put together. Uh, we're gonna put it in the chat. I encourage you all to listen to those. The second resource is that we've created a reading list with books that document the experience of survivors and families victimized by the residential school system. Um, I have a couple of books that I personally think are incredible and very useful to learn about this history. Uh, this by Alicia Elliott is one of my favorites. And Michelle Good just won the Governor General Award for this phenomenal book as well. So I highly recommend those. Now the, sh the third resource uh, is that we're gonna share the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I wanna encourage all of you to read them, to think about the individual ways that you can help move these along, like maybe writing a letter to your MP or organizing with your friends and neighbors. So thank you for um, thinking about this today. Now, today's event is very exciting to me for two reasons. First, because we get to celebrate the publication of Michael Lapointe's very first book, which is, I tell you, it's impossible to put down. Here's the book, it's incredible. Um, and the second reason that I'm excited about this is because this book takes us to a period right after 9-11, when the Bush administration uh, unleashed the war on terror, and it talks about how this era affected public trust in the media, which helps us understand the area of rampant disinformation that we live in today. So it's a very relevant, very current book. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's speakers. Uh, so Michael, Kevin, can you please join me on stage? Great. Nice to see you both. Thank so you. Michael Lapointe is a writer and critic who lives in Toronto. He has written for The Atlantic, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Times Literary Supplement, and The Paris Review. His fiction has appeared in The Walrus and Hazlitt. He's not been nominated for the National Magazine Awards, the Journey Prize, and Digital Publishing Awards. And his work has also been anthologized in The Best Canadian Stories and The Best Canadian Essays. So this is his first novel, The Creep. Here it is again, it's beautiful. And to guide the conversation today, we have uh, Kevin Chong. Kevin is an assistant professor of creative studies and creative writing at UBC. He's the author of seven books of fiction and nonfiction. Most recently, the novel, The Plague. Uh, his books have been named Books of the Year by the Globe and Mail, the National Post, and others. And they've also been optioned for film and TV. Um, his creative nonfiction and journalism has also appeared in The Guardian, The Times Literary Supplement, The Rumpus, and The South China Morning Post. So thank you both for being here. Very excited to hear your conversation. And Kevin, take it away. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Thank you for uh, those eloquent remarks, too, about uh, uh, recent events uh, and going just beyond the, the sort of the boilerplate on uh, land acknowledgement and stuff like that. So it's always good to sort of move beyond that and try to really think and articulate uh, our thoughts about, you know, where we're uh, speaking from and where we're learning from and reading from. Um, I wanted to say that we're going to have a Q&A and before I forget and that I really welcome questions. Uh, I'm going to try my best to uh, entertain and ask Michael uh, as many of the questions that you pose to him as possible. You know, like I know, I know some of the people who are on the participant list, who, and I know some of them know Michael very well. And I'm sure you have great questions to ask, and uh, I look forward to posing them uh, to him. Um, but before I uh, go into that, I want to tell you, those of you who haven't read The Creep are really, uh, have something have something really uh, special to look forward to because it's a sharply written media satire as well as a thriller with four elements. And it's a book that really sp speaks to our time in terms, as Jorge was saying, in terms of, you know, uh, how, truth can be manufactured, how truth can be uh, 
uh, manipulated. Um, it's a story about uh, that, has, that borrows from like more recent history, uh, I think, in some ways, and then you know uh, the 9/11 era too. So uh, I, I really want to ask Michael a lot about that. So the first question I have for you, Michael, is that this novel is set in the final days of print media's dominance before it became euphemistically known as legacy media. You grew up in that environment, but you're younger than the main character, Brittany Chase. Uh, was there anything you learned about writing about the last throws of the glossy magazine dominance? And was there an element of nostalgia or relatedness in choosing this time? Hmm. Um, well, you know, first of all, thanks for doing this, Kevin. And thanks to everyone at the VPL and um, everyone who's attending. It's really sweet to see you all, uh, though I can't see your faces. Um, uh, I like the word belatedness, I think. Um, I'm not a nostalgic person, and I don't, I don't think the book is particularly nostalgic for a, a period when, you know, magazines were uh, better paying and, like, um, you know, uh, journalistic jobs were, were, like, lower hanging fruit to, to get because, um, on the one hand, it's like I can, I can definitely uh, sense that you know historically things are worse now as far as like the average paycheck in media, um, but at the same time, like we've gained so much over recent years. You know, like in the in the novel, the magazine that Whitney works at, I, I very pointedly made it so like there's really not another woman on staff, uh, and like you know people of color are pretty much non-existent in that milieu, um, and so it's like you know, although some things have been lost as far as like the economics, the economics have shifted um, for the worse in many ways. Um, in other ways, like the media ecosystem is in a much healthier place now than it was um, when Whitney was ostensibly working, which is like late, late 90s into the early 2000s. Um, as far as my own personal experience goes, uh, I was definitely given like a first class uh, tour of like glossy magazine um, writing when uh, a few years ago, I did a, a true crime feature for the Atlantic magazine. And it was definitely like a, a kind of old fashioned um, like, like tour of, uh, of what it would be like to be a full-time staff writer at one of these magazines. It was one of those like um, fly you around, you know, put you up in hotels, waste lots of time, uh, you know, not get much done some days, get a lot done other days, um, you know, uh, wonder whether or not you can build the alcohol to the magazine and then try it and see what happens, that kind of thing. Um, and that was such a stark contrast to like my other experiences of writing for magazines as like a whatever millennial writer, I guess you'd call it, um, where you're, you know, you're, you're, hour to uh, dollar ratio is like, you know, 20 to one or whatever. Um, and so it was in the contrast between those two experiences that I could begin to feel my way into like a, a more generational contrast between what it's like to, to write now and what it would be like to write then. Probably biographically speaking, I have more in common with the vice journalist who's interviewing Whitney toward whom she shows like a kind of friendly contempt um, that's probably like, that would, that would be me if I were anyone in this book that would, you know, um, the kind of awkward, uh, vice journalist, uh, getting paid $150 for the article. That would be, that would chime with my experience more. As I pose this question, I realized that in some ways you're like this, like you're a scion of legacy media, like your dad, Kirk LaPointe, uh, was you know uh, an executive editor of the Vancouver Sun, you know, uh, in a, and a, a magazine publisher. Like, is there anything you gained from osmosis there, or was was there any time where you asked him about some sort of particular detail about being in a newsroom in the nineties? Uh, well, I should say my mother as well was also a, like a high profile journalist. She was she worked for the CBC for a long time, um, radio and television, um, and so I mean, yeah, I grew up in those spaces, um, like. You know, I, I remember I would, you know, in lieu of a babysitter, I would go hang out in the newsroom or whatever. Um, but uh, and so, yeah, like I definitely I, I, I'm sure I did absorb a lot of 
a lot of stuff from that. But at the same time, I guess like the the magazine in this book is such a, a fantasy of a of a magazine. Like it's it isn't nostalgic, but it is like symbolic um, of that time. And I'm not sure any Canadian magazine really like um, like quite <laughs> reached that level. Yeah. Like it's, like a, it's sort of like a Harper. You, you, you can only in the seat of, of media power, which is New York, can this type of magazine really exist. Um, but, uh, but yeah, certainly, I mean, I grew up among journalists, which is why I feel comfortable satirizing them, I suppose, without feeling like it's, um, you know, mean or like un untoward in some way. Um, Cause I'm really just, you know, I guess making fun of my family. <laughs> um, your novel, The Creep gets its title from both the many creeps in this novel, and there are quite a few, but also the idea of truth creeping uh, and being sort of degraded. Is that another reason why it was set in the aftermath of 9-11, which was the starting point of a raft of conspiracy theories and led indirectly to the Iraq war with its sort of false weapons of mass destruction rationale? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I know that historically there are other watershed moments you could identify where um, like fiction in some way began to intrude upon uh, fact in the public forum. Um, like maybe like the Nixon's like checkers speech or something like that is like a, something. Um, but for me personally, you know, I was born in 1987 and um, the dawn of my kind of like semi-adult political uh, awakening was like 2000. So like Bush v. Gore and then, you know, 9-11 and then the Iraq war. And perhaps naively at that time, um, I did believe in fact as like a, a kind of um, a, a solid thing that could be that could be identified and that if, and if you had the facts on your side, um, you know, that would, that would be uh, kind of like arrows in your quiver or whatever. And you could, you could prevail over an, an ideological opponent by referring to fact. This was like a child's view of how politics operates. And um, so for me at the, at the very inception of my political uh, awakening was also a, a disillusioning uh, process because what I saw was that, um, you know, we were participating in the biggest protests of all time and they were, they were essentially meaningless or impotent. Um, and that the, the media that precisely would be the, um, the kind of, uh, uh, wardens of truth, um, were participating actively and in some ways, um, like reveling in their participation in the the uh kind of the intrusion of of fiction into into fact and so um yeah i wanted to it's it just seemed like a perfect uh again like a symbolic uh moment to uh to set the book when not only is um you know the uh, media kind of declining in terms of its economic strength but also this new style of discourse is is ascendant and that is this I guess, kind of creep discourse, uh, which is the drift over the, the fact fiction divide. Enabled by the internet, too, I would say. Uh, yeah. My next question is, to what extent is Rubicon, the medical company headed by Eva Chris in your novel, uh, based on Theranos and its founder, Elizabeth Holmes? I, I definitely got that vibe. And was there uh, any sort of research that this spun off into? Um, it's funny that you mentioned Elizabeth Holmes because um, the, so I, I wrote this book in 2018 um, in like the first, I think I began it around like January of 2018. And uh, the, the book Bad Blood by John Carreyrou came out um, while I was like writing the first draft of it. The original design of the, of the book didn't, I didn't really think about Elizabeth Holmes. Um, and then I read that book and I really liked it. And I thought to myself, well, this would be kind of a funny thing to draw upon. So I put all these little like Theranos Easter eggs into the book. And then the documentary came out and it became this like huge phenomenon. 
And so I went back and I took all of them out because it just seemed like too, it seems like I didn't want people to think that it was like, you know, based on that too much. Um, I think there's like one or two that still are in there maybe which people could find, but um, the, actually the, the case that was most inspiring originally was not the Elizabeth um, Holmes uh, quagmire, but the, 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 uh, the case of Paolo Macchiarini. Um, I don't know if that name rings a bell for you or anyone, but it was kind of a big story in Europe and less of a story here in North America, but he was a, um, a superstar surgeon and medical um, inventor essentially who uh, was an Italian who worked at the Karolinska Institute, which is the, the, the hospital in Sweden that awards the Nobel Prize in medicine. And he, on his resume was that he was the surgeon to the Pope and he was the surgeon to the Clintons and he was developing um, stem cell uh, organ replacements. So he was focused mainly on the trachea and he would, he would basically build these um, like plastic tubes that were modeled after a trachea, sort of like a Cronenberg appearing type thing. And he would bathe them in stem cells and then implant them into patients. And the idea was that the trachea would, uh, the stem cells would like integrate the, the, the plastic, the polar, whatever, you know, type of material they were using trachea into the body. And because he was this superstar surgeon, he was considered, you know, like totally above board. And uh, it turned out that um, not only had he fabricated most of his medical credentials, not only had he never been surgeon to the Pope or to the Clintons, but uh, his trachea were completely faulty and everyone that he installed one of these devices into died. Um, and it was an incredibly gruesome uh, case of medical malpractice um, that still is going on to this day. Um, there's a wonderful Swedish documentary that I think got released here called The Experiments. Um, that is, I, when I watched that, it was so horrifying that I, I felt like if I could somehow tap into that, um, I would be able to, to tell a horror story, which was what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. Now, do you think the reason why this Swedish surgeon is lying similar to the way Eva is like the, her rational, Eva is rational for lying. Are those rationales similar to why uh, Whitney is making up stories? Do you, do, do they, are they coming from the same place? With this uh, making up things, are they trying to please? Is it like, like a mental disorder? <laughs> it's a good question. The, I mean, there's certainly, as far as like the structure of the fiction goes, they're foils to each other. The, the con artist, doctor who is developed this artificial blood substitute that she is transfusing into patients that everyone thinks is a medical miracle. Um, she finds her reflection in our, in our narrator, Whitney, who fabricates details of her stories in order to secure a career as a journalist. Um, it's definitely one thing I struggled with in the writing of the book was like trying to penetrate the psychology of, I guess you'd call them the villain, which is to say like Ava Chris, this doctor who's developed this artificial blood substitute. Um, and at a certain point I was like, it's impossible to, it's impossible to imagine my way into that mind. Um, and in a way it's not even necessary for me to do so because, um, you know, Whitney is the narrator. And so the limits of her consciousness is also the limits of my consciousness as a, as a writer. Uh, her ability to understand is my ability to understand. Um, and so, I mean, I've never, I, I can't imagine myself into the mind of someone who would undertake um, clearly faulty, clearly doomed experiments uh, on human lives, um, thinking somehow that they're just gonna be able to tell yet one more lie to kind of get themselves over. I can't, like, maybe it's because I'm, I, feel too skilled as a liar or something like that. I could never like set myself up for such clear and obvious like potential spectacular failure as a liar. Um, so it's really hard to kind of imagine myself into the villain's mind that way. Um, but, cer but certainly they, you know, in all sorts of different ways over the course of the book, they find their reflection in each other. 
I, I felt like Whitney wasn't necessarily lying to Khan. Like she was lying to like tell a story, lying to maybe please editors. Whereas when I was thinking about what drove Ava, it, it seemed like it was more like the con, like like performing a miracle and sort of deceiving people. And 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 there, there's like that stream. That's where I feel like the creep in our real lives come from this this desire to deceive people to just get clicks and i think it's different from where uh whitney was coming from so i really appreciate uh that answer and that, uh, the thoughtfulness you put in there yeah the i mean definitely um, moving on uh let me change gears uh yes no no please please okay uh the way uh, sex is depicted in this novel uh, can be blunt and ro unromantic, kind of funny too, actually. Um, at one point though, Whitney is sexually assaulted by a coworker who later attempts to expose her for her fabrications as a writer. This is a real pivotal part of your novel. And how she responds in one of, is, uh, results in one of the most chilling scenes in the book. Uh, can you talk about sex and how it relates to Whitney's worldview. Uh, and would you say, you know, Whitney's attitudes in 2001 are more Generation X or reflective of our current discourse on sex and consent? Next question, please. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I mean, I see Whitney definitely as like, sex positive like I think she enjoys sex like that's it's clear early on in the book like she she enjoys sex she's capable of um healthy if perhaps slightly like utilitarian sexual relationships um which is not unlike many people that I you know know um who are good people like morally speaking um so she she's like a healthy uh she has a healthy sex life um it's more so intimacy that she has problems with. Um, if for many people, sex is kind of like a, a portal into intimacy, um, for Whitney, uh, she describes what, what she calls in herself like a wall, um, which is some kind of definite limit in her own personality beyond which no one can uh, penetrate, you know, not sexually, but emotionally. Um, she, has, she has just kind of a check against any sort of um, true intimacy between people. And so I wanted to use sex in the book as a way to kind of delineate that inner limit um, precisely because it's a, uh, um, you know, it's, it's commonly just like the, the way that we connect uh, with someone on a very profound level. Uh, for Whitney, it's not that. For Whitney, um, because of certain experiences she's had, and also just because of who she is dispositionally, um, sex doesn't lead to a, to deeper uh, relationships. It, it, it only throws into relief uh, the, the difficulty that she has with forming intimacies. Um, and also like there are, you know, there are undeniably a lot of like sort of evil penises in this book. Uh, I don't know how to put it any other way. Um, yeah you know, like when I was thinking, when I was conceiving of the book as a horror novel and thinking about um, different images that I wanted to recur throughout the book that would get kind of spookier and spookier as they go along in the kind of classic horror fashion, um, it seemed to me only natural that, uh, you know, penises would be something like that for Whitney, that like that would be, um, that, that they would just become uh, more and more horrific basically as the book progresses. So, there is a lot of ugly um, sex in the book, uh, which is part of Whitney's um, tragedy, essentially, that she's not able to, uh, you know, have those have those relationships without them being, um, well, I won't spoil it, but going really wrong. Um, as far as Gen X, I'm not sure I know, like, I'm not sure I'll be able to characterize myself what the Generation X, like, viewpoint on sex would be um and how no that comment. <laughs> yeah exactly that's up to you yeah. uh, or if there's any gen xers in the chat um i do though i definitely always pictured whitney as like one of these writers who would have been viewed as very progressive 
in the early 2000s, but would probably find have difficulty fitting into contemporary discourse, not just on questions of sex, but on like a raft of sort of social issues. Um, I just see her as someone who, like, I, I do think like she just, uh, she's so insular and so self-determined. Um, I think any kind of mass movement, uh, any kind of, whether that be a protest movement or a social movement, I think she just, by virtue of the fact that it's a mass movement, I think she would just discount participation out of hand. Like she, she would have found a way to not fit in, even if she was, um, uh, like, even if she did feel sympathy with the with the cause. Um, she just strikes me as someone who, um, like, uh, you know, doesn't want to connect with people even through um, tragedy or trauma. Now that seems very Gen X too, actually. Uh, yeah. I've got a couple of questions, uh, a couple more questions to go. And I'm again, reminding people who have questions to ask Michael, just to start typing them up uh, in the Q&A and I'll gladly relay them. Uh, having said that, I'm gonna move on. Uh, there's an early scene with Whitney and I have to say, uh, I was really, uh, impressed by the characterization of Whitney as a, you know, as a very complex and contradictory character, and not just, you know, like a boilerplate protagonist in a thriller. Uh, there's an early scene with her as a child trapped in snow, becomes tied to her inability as a child to speak for a year, and after the death of her father. I think it's probably the only moment where we see a more tender, vulnerable side of her. Uh, do you feel loss and trauma inspire a need in people to tell stories? Oh, it's interesting. Like one of my original conceptions for Whitney was I wanted her to be kind of like a noir character, um, sort of like a detective, you know, like who, like in a way they kind of exist spontaneously without like biography or psychology in a sense, like, you know, like you don't really ask Sam Spade, like, how did you get this way kind of thing? No. Um, uh, so um, it, it's not, yeah, it's, it's like, you're, you're right to say, I think that there's, there's these very few kind of tender moments and they, um, you have to kind of stay alert to them because they, they are few and far between. For the most part, she's a very uh, contained, like, figure who, who doesn't want to let out uh, particularly much. Um, as far as trauma telling stories, I mean, certainly like there's the common conception of telling as a catharsis. And, um, you know, this is something that is in some cases a misconception. I guess it comes probably from talk therapy, which maybe has its origins in like the confessional booth or something like that. The sense that putting words to an experience begins the process of alleviating that experience or absolving yourself of that experience. And certainly like in many cases, that's true. And we've all had experiences where like talking it out uh, has helped us. Um, but, you know, Whitney, in this case, it, it's, it's explicitly the story she's not telling. So there's the, there's the story, there's the, she's, having an interview with a with a journalist from Vice who's come to ask her about her career, her, her long dead career in journalism. There's the story she's telling to the journalist and then the story we're reading, that's the creep, is the, is the story she's not telling, the story she's withholding. And so I wanted to actually kind of like flip the idea of, of, of uh, telling as catharsis and have it be a story that's almost like a worm that's just like eating into you uh, deeper and deeper because you're not telling it. And, um, you know, there's, there's reasons that I won't spoil for why Whitney's not telling this story. Um, there's things she can't tell that happened. Um, so I wanted the book to be, yeah, just kind of like this, this much more kind of like painfully introverted experience um, where the story is, is kind of building up and building up and building up inside you. And because it's unspeakable, um, that's kind of leads to the, 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 the tragedy or the self, the, the self-destructive tendencies that Whitney exhibits. I've got a last question. There are already two questions that have uh, popped up on the screen and so I appreciate those. Uh, my last question to you is, uh, do you think there's some creep within all of us? By that I mean, 
something immoral or something situational in our morality that might lead us to do evil shit if given enough incentive or we're forced into a corner? Well, um, I mean, I think a lot of things have to go wrong in a row for you to ever do the things that Whitney does in this book. Um, so I guess some of that is attributable to luck. Um, but uh, I guess the sh my, my answer would be yes. And it's like, it's interesting that I think about, um, you, you brought up like Elizabeth Holmes earlier. Um, like someone like Elizabeth Holmes is put forward as a kind of spectacular example of the fake it till you make it ethos gone, like run amok or whatever, right? This idea that, um, yeah, you just kind of put on a face and hopefully you become uh, the mask or whatever at some point. Um, and that can lead you to becoming a con artist because you um, you so desperately want to be this thing that you're not, that you will go to any length to become it. Um, and I do think that like, it's an experience that many people can relate to now in like the conditions of like late capitalism, whatever you want to put it, or like in conditions of resource scarcity uh, economically, um, that pressure to, uh, to, to kind of um, uh, pretend that effort to like, to, to fake an identity until it becomes real uh, and, and maybe along the way lose sight of yourself that seems to me like an increasingly common or prevalent um, uh, phenomenon as people, you know, try to try to build lives in like an extremely difficult economic circumstance. Um, so I'm not saying that everyone would like, you know, start transfusing um, like fake plastic blood into each other uh, under all circumstances. Um, but in little ways, we do all have uh, some of that inside of us, I think. Um, and I think that that's probably getting like worse all the time as uh, as people feel more and more pressure to um, become something. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm going to turn to some of the questions that are on the screen. Also, some really great ones, actually. Uh, the first one is from a, an anonymous attendee. Is it possible to people for people to rebuild their trust in the media? What has to happen and change? Also. What is the difference between lying and keeping things shush shush? What is more harmful? Man, um, I am not like a media like prophet or anything like that. Like I have no, <laughs> I don't have any, you know, I've thought about it. I, I'm, everyone I feel like over the last few years has thought about kind of like how we put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, I definitely don't, I'm not persuaded at this point that it is possible. I, I do think that like um, people will continue to become more and more siloed. Um, and that's just, that's just by virtue of um, like the, 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 the market economics of media, which has created product media products that anyone that you can, that you can style to your own personal taste. You know, the idea that everyone would be watching the same television broadcast or reading the same newspaper and therefore forming points of common reference um, that you know, we all would commonly understand as being true. Um, I, just don't, I just don't see how that's really possible, even as corporate media becomes more and more homogenous and like um, you know, uh, uh, fewer outlets seem to exist of the kind of major you know, newspapers or magazines that also creates a vacuum wherein um, all sorts of like fringe products um, become have, have hit the market that people really connect with um, for better and for worse. Um, and I don't think that that can really come back together again. I think we're in for a pretty rocky ride as we like discover how to have democracies um, with without any kind of understanding of like objective reality basically. Um, uh, so I, I think that'll just continue to get worse. I, I don't know how to put that back together. Um, as far as lying or keeping things shush shush, um, you know, they're, they're both the same in some regards. Um, and I think, and I think if you keep something quiet, I mean, I feel like we're just talking around like the, you know, the discovery in Kamloops and it's like, 
if you keep something quiet, that nest that that, necess that necessitates lying. You will have to lie to yourself in a million ways every day, in perpetuity, in order to keep that thing quiet. And it's never quiet. Uh, it it cannot be quiet. It's it only gets louder. Um, so uh, they're both they're both the same and they're both bad. Yeah, that's a really uh, a nice way of speaking about sort of silence versus uh, uh, speaking an outright lie. Uh, I'm going to borrow that in the days and weeks to come. Uh, the next question is a craft question from Patterson Warner. Uh, what surprised you the most about the final version versus what you thought it would be when you started writing it? Hmm. Well, when you start writing, you think you're going to do something good. And then uh, the final version is what you actually did. Uh, so that's that's usually the divide. Um, but, uh, well, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it, actually. Like, the it it was, this book is very, like, cleanly organized in my mind from a very early uh, like imaginative phase of the process. So uh, it did it did have a kind of, I think when you're really writing a plotted book in this sense, like a, you know, a, a book that really relies upon like a more, more conventional plotting, um, once you kind of slot in that, that or those organizational uh, like features, um, it's really just like a question of whether you can execute. The, the conception is there and it's just a question of whether you can execute. Um, but there's always a gap that, like a shadow that falls between, you know, what you have in your mind and what it becomes. There's actually a part in the book where Whitney is contemplating the, um, the story she's gonna write. And uh, she's, she's drunk and she's, she's really high on all the possibilities of what she's gonna write. And she says that, uh, that it's it was it's perfect in her mind, uh, pure concept, no words, uh, and that's that's kind of like a pleasant part of the writing phase when it's just pure concept, and you haven't yet actually had to create material materiality out of it, um, because you know it's a cl cliche, but words do tend to kind of undermine your your concept as you actually try to build it in language. It it always gets a little bit um, muddled. <laughs> well, well said. Uh, I'm going to take a question that's in the chat screen now from Charles Montgomery. Uh, have you constructed stories about yourself or the world in order to become something? In order to become something? Yeah. Uh, hmm. uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I've told lies about myself, I guess. And to that extent, if you're trying to create um, a vision of yourself in someone else's mind that is, you know, more positive than the reality, I guess I have um, done that. I haven't done that like professionally, uh, to my memory. Um, <laughs> you know, like usually the question that I get on this is just like, have you like made up stuff in your journalist or like nonfiction work? Um, and the, the short answer is no. Uh, and if like, if I have made mistakes, it's just due to stupidity or, or like basic error rather than like, you know, malfeasance. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I know. I don't think so. I, I feel like, uh, I feel like I've been pretty consistent over the years <laughs> as far as who I am. Like, I mean, I, I, not to get too like biographical, I guess, but like, um, uh, I did like move around a lot as a kid by virtue of having journalistic parents. It kind of meant that we were moving like all the time. Um, and whenever I wasn't moving, I was like being like, I was moving schools in the same city or changing classes in the same school. Like, like very, very, very frequently I was in this process of like being the new person. And uh, in some sense that gives you this um, opportunity to like reinvent yourself and like, you know, if you wanted to totally change your your personality, you could do so. Um, but in the in reality, what that actually does, it really kind of like calcifies your personality. Like you, 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 because you are the only constant in your environment. Um, 
you know, you, you begin to just sort of like rely upon a certain degree of stability in yourself. Um, and so like I have matured and like evolved and changed and all those sorts of good qualities, but um, I do feel like I've been pretty much the same uh, type of person for many years, for better and for worse. That, that question really has like this sort of like existential element to it. Um, yeah, I'm ready for that. You, you really plumbed very well. Um, Lee Henderson, our dear friend, asked from Victoria, what are Michael's top uh, picks for literary horror fiction or books that inform uh, yours? And I'm going to ask you, I'm going to tag my question. Uh, uh, is DeLillo, Don DeLillo an influence on this book? Because, you know, there's a coolness to the voice that I detect in it. And there's also that sort of pharmaceutical industry satire. Was, was he a conscious influence? Because he's not in some ways thematically uh, an influence, but I, I can maybe like in terms of like uh, a formative writer who sort of uh, uh, really put his stamp on your like uh, style. Yeah, um, I mean, DeLillo, I definitely like, uh, yeah, I can't escape the DeLillo influence. Uh, I like, it's like, it's like the box that I like can't, you know, see around. I think he's like the greatest, like living American writer, probably. Um, even though I have like a, um, I only, you know, I've read, I think all of his books and like only really like five or six of them. And there's like, I don't know, 15 or 16, um, do I really love? And when he's bad, he's like extremely bad. Um, but uh, but definitely like that that vo uh, I don't know it's not it's not a voice really but it's just like a it's like a slant or like a, a it's like an attitude toward uh, contemporary life that I definitely is an influence that you know maybe one day I will shake but uh, certainly in this book it could not um, um, Lee was asking about literary horror or books that influenced this one um, yeah. uh, one book that definitely influenced this book uh is um a work by a bioethicist named carl elliott who wrote a book called um white coat black hat which was all about um just like uh violations of medical ethics in contemporary american health um and it was kind of interesting like i was i was um i was constantly imagining horrific situations um just trying to come up with more and more horrific ones and it seemed as though I would be straining credulity. Like, for instance, in the book, you know, there's this whole um, plot wherein uh, paramedics have been conscripted to participate in the medical trial and administer the blood, the, the fake blood to, uh, to unwitting subjects who are unconscious. Um, and uh, like in their ambulance, they receive the blood transfusion. And I kind of read into the, the laws and found how you could bypass consent as a subject if, the, if it seemed to be like the only treatment available. And I was thinking to myself, like, is this crazy? Like, is this gonna be one of those things that like readers or reviewers are just like, this is so unbelievable that there's no you know, possibility that this could, could exist and it really would undermine the, the drama. Um, and then I just found that as I read more and more like I just constantly realized that I was imagining something that was already taking place. Um, that like shortly after I came up with that, I read a story about paramedics in Minneapolis who were giving ketamine to patients um, without their consent as part of a medical trial uh, of, a, of a corporation that, that it was paying their hospital to, to get garner results for like how ketamine worked on different people. And so, you know, you would like be stabbed and you would be unconscious and taken into an ambulance and they would give you ketamine without your consent um, and then record like how it, how it went for you and you'd be part of a medical trial um, without knowing. Um, so that, that book and, you know, and uh, several others were big. As far as literary horror, I actually was not, I don't really, it, horror movies was like the main, um, main influence, not so much horror novels. Like I'm very conventional in my like uh, horror novel, like literary horror taste. Um, the uh, uh, horror movies with The Shining being the most important one and like films of David Cronenberg, um, these were really influential on the, on the book throughout. 
Wonderful. Um, I've got, I guess, two last questions from the audience, uh, which I'm going to smush together. And, uh, and I think we, we can wrap things up unless there's somebody who wants to get a question under the wire. Uh, and those two questions are, are you planning an in-person book tour and what's next? And I'm going to add what's next in terms of your journalism or in terms of your creative work. Is that it seems like these practices run alongside one another in fascinating ways. Uh, I would love to do anything in person. I would hang out with my mortal enemy uh, right, this, right this instant if I could. Uh, so there's no plans for um, there's no plans for an in person book tour, um, but you know we'll see how it goes over the next few months. Uh, pandemic publishing is like a crazy thing. Um, you know, none of us could have expected that we would be here on Zoom together, uh, you know, not long ago. So um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. If, if many, many people buy copies of the book, perhaps that will happen, um, but we'll see. Um, what's next? Well, uh, I wrote another book uh, during this, this time here in my uh, living room uh, over the last year and a half. Um, it's a novel. Uh, that's called uh, Watch Close, and it's about a uh, movie critic kind of based on like a Gene Siskel type character who uh, loses his job as uh, on his show and ends up investigating the murder of a magician in Los Angeles in like 1997. So it's sort of like a sort of like a comedic uh, noir uh, that takes place in the world of magic and uh, movies, uh, card tricks, basically. Is this a literary thriller again, or is it trying to be more commercial? Uh, I would call it a, yeah, I would say it's a literary thriller. Like I, I, you know, once you put those two words together, they sort of like become diffuse, you know, like, like, you know, the, it's supposed to be a, there's supposed to be a line between those two words and yeah. put them together. They like start to Venn diagram. Um, I definitely do, you know, in the novel projects that I'm working on, I definitely try to have them be accessible on kind of any level that you want to take them. Like if you, if you just want to read it for the story and the, the excitement of like the mystery or whatever, then that's um, like a totally feasible way of, of reading it. If you want to, plumb the depths of the thematics and like the broader historical messaging, then that's something you can hopefully fruitfully do as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, and I guess that's commercial or something, but I mean, we'll see how commercial it is. The book's been out for 48 hours, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, we did get a question under the wire and it's a good one from Heather. Uh, hi, Michael, what process do you go through as a writer to craft a character who has undergone traumatic experiences. Was this process more research uh, slash logic or emotion-based? Hmm. That is a good question. Um, yeah, that's really hard. Um, I don't, it's not really research because I don't think you can, if you're, if you're building a character and that essential um, quality of them is based in research, I think that's probably not gonna like work particularly well as a character. Um, certainly research can inform and undergird the, the character, but if, if their core psychology is, is something you've read or watched or, or learned, uh, you know, through a mediated, uh, some kind of media, that's probably not gonna be particularly effective. Um, so inevitably there has to be some um, emotional input I, I tend to, I usually tend to look to like Gothic literature for this. I always like Gothic literature as a, as a way of uh, thinking about characters because um, in, in Gothic literature, there's just some, there's always some inexplicable, irrational force that undermines the characters. Um, and it kind of erupts through their psychology, some sort of passion or, um, or, you know, it doesn't even have a source. It just seems it's, that's why it's kind of Gothic. It just seems haunt, they seem haunted or something like that. Um, so I do, I do like to have that element in, in characters, like uh, some, 
inexplicable, illogical. Um, it was either always there or it was imperceptibly acquired feature to them that that um, creates that, that creates their slant, that creates their kind of crooked nature. Um, that that tends to be the the, the method. Uh, that was awesome. That was a great answer. Uh, there's no more questions, but there is a request now in the Q and A, and someone, and Michael's been escaped doing a reading uh, when we were planning this, but there is a request from someone in the audience to hear a brief excerpt from your book. Uh, would you want to read a little bit from the creep, Michael, or are we just gonna uh, like- uh, Good, I don't even know where I have. I have to find a copy of the book. Uh, oh. It's just over here, just hold on. Uh, oh, goodness. Okay. Um, Oh my God. What part should I read, Kevin? You read the book more recently than I have. Uh, the parts that really pop into my mind are probably, well, the igloo scene early on and the, and the ones that are real sort of juicy that you don't want to ruin. So maybe maybe the, a, a short part of the igloo scene or uh, let me see. Uh, that might be a little, or maybe just the opening, like with, with the interviewer from the Vice. Okay. Or the bit about the fact check, according to Hore. So many different, so many options. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. I'll read about this, this igloo uh, section. Um, oh, Jorge actually has a request. Hold on. 108, 109. No, 8, 109, he says. What's on this page? Uh, oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. This is a scene where uh, Whitney has just come back from a reporting trip in Florida, and she is um, uh, having a conversation with her editor. His name, his name is Mort, Mort Brewer. He's the editor of The Bystander, which is the name of the magazine she works for. He has become obsessed with the Iraq war uh, discourse. Um, he's not really paying attention to what Whitney's doing anymore because he's obsessed with what's happening uh, in Iraq. And she says, uh, the terror risk was orange for elevated when I returned to the city from Florida. While I'd been gone, the Iraq fixation had intensified at the bystander, but Mort had suspended the debates in his office. Everywhere he looked, he sensed a pandemic of misinformation and didn't want his magazine contaminated. The latest outrage was that Cheney had gone on CNN and said Saddam was developing nuclear weapons. They've already got the will for war, Mort told me. Now they're looking for the way and the press is just letting them improvise it right out in the public arena. In his anger, Mort didn't pay much attention to my return. He asked perfunctory questions about the trip and reimbursed my expenses, but it seemed as if he barely recalled the subject of my story. There was a burgeoning mania in him that I see now as that of someone losing his grip on history. Mort had been formed by the LBJ and Nixon years. He saw journalism as the shield of democracy. I don't think he was prepared for how the press was unraveling. Reading the news, you might think Saddam was developing warheads in a bunker beneath a hospital in Baghdad. You might think Iraqi agents conspired with a 9-11 hijacker in Prague. You might think bin Laden met with high-level Ba'athists in Khartoum. We never recovered from the fissure of those months when the press did such a miserable job of sifting fiction from its facts. Since then, it's become common to meet people on the left and the right who categorically discount whatever the media reports. When asked why, they invoke the lead up to Iraq and there's nothing you can say. Mort was lost in this new reality, or perhaps it would be better to call it a realm, an adjacent zone where fact and fiction mingle freely and the effort to distinguish them is wasted. Mort's vision of journalism assumed a reader with a common understanding of facts, facts as solid things, the foundation of meaning. It seems ridiculous now that an entire industry could go so long believing people wanted facts 
when in fact they crept like me. There you go. Nicely read. Uh, well done, Michael. Uh, again, uh, if you, hadn't, uh, you ha haven't had a chance to read The Creep, you're going to really, really enjoy it. And I want to thank Michael very much uh, for uh, spending time with us tonight. And I want to thank the VPL for uh, asking me to do this event. It was a real pleasure. Uh, and yeah, Michael, I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, reading this book uh, in person on stage and reading your uh, more recent novel too. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's lovely to see you. Lovely yeah. to see you. Thank you both for being here and for that conversation. It was wonderful. And thank you for indulging my very specific request for reading that <laughs> chapter, which I've right. read over and over. I love it. Um, thanks again for being uh, here and spending your, your afternoon and evening with, with us. Um, for the audience, if you want to watch this event again or you want to share it with your friends, uh, we're live streaming this live to a Facebook page right now for PPL's Facebook page. So you can find it there after the event and just link it. Uh, Candy is going to link the actual uh, video page of our Facebook page right now, so you can go click on it right now. Um, I want to thank Pulp Fiction Books again for partnering with the library on this event, and please remember that they're offering an extra discount if you buy the creep from them in the next couple of weeks. Um, also, if you want to give us feedback about this event, uh, it'd be very uh, useful for us. As a public institution, our job really is to do programs that work for you. So uh, your feedback is really important. We're gonna put a link to a form. Um, it takes about two minutes to fill out and I promise you it doesn't end up in some black hole of the internet. I actually sit with my team and we read your replies. So it does make an impact in how we program. Um, lastly, to wrap up, I'm gonna tell you that on June 9th, we have a very exciting event coming up. It's uh, about the history of indigenous comedy. And so we're bringing uh, comedy historian Cliff Nesteroff and he's gonna be chatting with two star comedians, Dakota Hebert and Ryan McMahon, who many of you probably know as the host of the podcast, Thunder Bay. So come here, uh, Dakota, Ryan, and Clip um, on June 9th. Uh, the event's called Laughter as Medicine, the History of Indigenous Comedy. So thanks everyone for being here. That's it for today. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon, evening. And I'm gonna do the awkward wave where we're all gonna disappear, but we're gonna let the event keep on going for a few minutes so that everyone can click on the multitude of links that we put there. So it's gonna stay open for five minutes. If Kevin and Michael wanna stay and chat there, that's up to them. But uh, the event's gonna be open for five minutes and I'm gonna leave as soon as I finish this sentence. Ciao. Bye everybody. I'm gonna leave too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.